suit and tie And get your hair cut way up high Get yourself a lawyer, son You're gonna need a real good one Ah, uh, here's our real good lawyer. David Whiting is with you, Melbourne solicitor, taking your calls. I've got a couple of lines free. one 300 If you never get through on the legal talkback line, I think this morning is your is your lucky morning. So quick, get to it before well, the three last lines that aren't taken are taken. David Whiting, good morning. Good morning, Virginia. You had a bit of homework, I think. I did. Uh, the first one was Simon from Morwell who rang for his daughter and his daughter was engaged as a carer for an NDIS client Mm. and the client had needs until about 10 o'clock at night and then again from 5 or 6 in the morning Mm. and she was paid a sleepover fee of about $55, uh, which is so far under the award as to be laughable. So there is a Health and Community Workers Award. Um, The problem will be, upon reflection, is that Simon's daughter is a contractor and not an employee. So we have this, you know, it's the constant, from the revenue point of view, they want everybody to be an employee because I can track what they get paid better. Yeah. But if you are a contractor, you're not bound by the terms of the award. So it's it's really, um, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I've, perhaps the answer would be if NDIS was to insist that their ultimate contractors be paid at or near an award rate, but that would just add another billion to the cost of the NDIS. So... Um, you know, I, I think ultimately it's going to be a union-driven. How do we make sure that these people get paid appropriately? But, but in the case of this individual daughter, uh, mm. and, and I, I accept this is not an easy thing. If her services are valued and sought after, she can always push back and, and argue for a higher overnight rate. Um, she can. The question is, if she was on an award, she could insist on being paid at that rate. Yes. She's not on an award, mm. and so she's a. You know, one one argument is she's free to contract, but that's right. But, but we all know there's an incredible imbalance in bargaining power. That's right. Yeah. So um, the answer would be, uh, she can she can ask, she can cajole, but she can't force. No, she can't. Yeah. No. But she may have. Um, Powers of persuasion. Yeah, or? she she may ultimately, if she's the if the only person she works for is that provider, mm. there might ultimately be a claim for back pay on the basis that I'm truly an employee and not a contractor. So and, keep a good uh, diary. What was our other matter? The other matter was we talked, and it builds very nicely on the call you had from Jack about 20 minutes ago uh, about uh, grumpy landlords, and yes. there are minimum standards for rental properties that we talked about, yes. and they're available on the consumer affairs website and they affect um, any rental agreements that started after the 29th of March uh, 2021 Mm -hmm. or rolled over into a periodic agreement after that time. And one of the things that you and I talked about was heating. Yes. And there's no requirement for air conditioning, but there is a requirement for a fixed heater, which is not portable, in good working condition in the main living area. Mm. So um, I would suggest that if you are a uh, a recipient uh, residing in a rental property, then I would be looking at the minimum rental standards on the uh, Consumer Affairs website and following through. Except uh, in the case we're discussing, it was about air conditioning. The unit was there when she arrived and uh, it's not working sufficiently. It's not, it's not cooling the entire place. I have a feeling the landlord can say, I'm not required to cool your whole place. I just have to have, you know, I don't even have to have an air conditioning unit. No, but there, in my mind, there's an expectation if there's an air conditioning vent there, it works and mm-hmm. it cools the space that it's intended to service. That's going to be so, a matter of an argument because she says it doesn't cool the entire place Well, no, no, it doesn't, but it's, it's really a question of does it... So you would get an assessment as to whether it works the way it's... It, Supposed it's, to purported as working, yes. and then what you would then do is go to VCAT and say, I want a rental reduction on the basis that I don't have the air conditioning that I contracted for. Let's get to your calls, one three hundred triple two seven seven four. Glennis in Inverloch, tell us what this situation is. Good morning, Virginia and David. Uh, I'll read some of this out because I don't want to forget anything, but um, two years ago my daughter and her partner paid... Um, nearly $20,000 deposit on a block of land uh, in a subdivision near Geelong with the land due to title in the third quarter of last year. Don't they want to live near you, Glennis? 
<laughs> no, no, and mm-hmm. it's so beautiful down here. <laughs> yes, go oh, on. Well, have, so what's the, what's the issue, Venus? Is the plan of subdivision not registered yet? No, no, it's not, and it won't be until early next year. Um, in the meantime, um, my daughter had a life-changing accident where she... Um, fell on some glass and um, and almost severed her hand. So she hasn't been able to work, work and she's uh, she's got permanent ongoing nerve loss and severe pain. Yep. Um, at this stage, she has no income and can't work. She's not eligible for Centrelink payments because her partner is earning just over the Centrelink threshold. Um, uh, so, Okay, um, Glennis, what they, you need to do is look. I take it that your daughter doesn't want, want to continue with the purchase anymore. Well, they can't. They don't have the money. No, I accept that. Right. Mm. What well, what you need to do is look at the plan of contract, the the contract, mm. and mm. see how long the developer gave himself to complete the to register the plan of subdivision. Three years. And when so is the three years up? It's. No, well, they're saying the uh, it will. No, it will. I'm, I'm not asking you when they think it will be finished. Mm. I'm asking you what the contract says is the drop dead date for plan registration. Uh, yes, I don't know what the date of well, plan well, registration. Well, if is. the plan of subdivision is not registered by that date, mm. your daughter has the ability to withdraw from the contract between the drop dead date and the date of actual plan registration. And if the date has passed, what, what are, what's her position? Well, if the, if the drop dead date is already passed, she can walk from the contract today. Mm-hmm. If the date... Uh, so, mm. you know, if, if the date hasn't arrived, she doesn't have that right yet. Yes, I mean, well, I've, I got, I've got two clients at the moment with subdivisions which are running late as a result of mm. issues arising but with uh, basically in both cases their water suppliers okay. and mm. uh, and we've had contra- we've had contracts fall over because we haven't been able to achieve. Is there a way that she can yeah. exit now? No. Well, well, she's been in, in contact with the developer. They know her situation. Um, they're not releasing it. They've said that she can put the block up for nomination um, where someone can take over the contract and the deposit returned. Um, but, you know, there's no certainty that's going to happen. No, none at all. She's, her mental health is, is, is really quite... is not good. And she really needs to settle quickly. Um, so could she get out of it um, on no. med- medical grants? no. No, the answer is she signed a contract. She's co- provided the contract is properly worded. She's stuck with the contract uh, unless she has the ability to withdraw because of the late registration of the plan of subdivision. So, as the developer says, her only other alternative is to put it up and to see someone else. Well, wants no, there'll to buy be a provision out. in the contract that says you can't on sell until you settle. What she's what 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 the developer has said is, will you go and find someone else to buy the block? Yes, that's what yes. I mean. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I'm sorry we haven't brought you good news this morning, Glennis. We'll leave it there, but thanks for calling in. Uh, let's hear from Lily in Brighton. Hi, Lily, go ahead. Hi, thanks, Virginia and David. Um, I have a question. I'm re- actually ringing on behalf of my husband. So he has a brother who has dementia, and um, his brother's lived with his wife, um, and who sh- the wife scared for him. Recently, the wife admitted herself to the hospital for uh, a medical issue, and because she lived with the, the husband, the husband came with her. Um, so while they're in the hospital, um, the hospital um, works out that she's um, impaired, her cognition is impaired somewhat as well, as well as the brother or he, her husband has um, dementia. Yes. So um, now the issue... They ta- um, so um, what happens, they Lily, one... is that the social worker issues an application at VCAT saying Correct. that these They've people done, are not capable that. of making their own decisions and somebody needs to be appointed to look after them. Yes. Yep. So my brother, sorry, my husband um, is the person with the dementia, brother, um, the person who is in the hospital. You, um, that's correct what you've said. They are putting an application through VCAT and hoping that my husband will become a guardian and an administrator yes. for his brother because he needs to be placed into HK and then we deal with the wife later. My question is, um, if both of those are given to my husband, um, we need, there's quite a few bills that have stuck, stacked up and we've picked them up from their mailbox. We need to pay. If um, we get these, um, if VCAT signs off on these, can we take these documents to the bank and say we've got, like, because they no, don't have if a If your If your husband gets an administration order, 
He yes. will be added as a signatory to your brother-in-law's bank account and he will have access to the account to enable him to pay the bills. Okay, so that's they can't dispute that if VCAT signs it off. Like, can I tell that, you, that. every time I get an administration order, I have a struggle with the bank, uh, but I've we've ultimately always received the right answer. Banks don't like... Banks call them a financial management plan because yeah. that's their universal language around the country. They don't like them, um, but but the, ultimately you will succeed. You you walk into the bank with a copy of the VCAT order that says, "I'm the administrator. Here I am. Here's my hundred points ID. Let's go for it." You're going to have a bit of a time, are you, at the office while you while they grapple with this? Well, no, at, at, a, the, at, the, at, the, at the bank, at the bank, yeah, yeah, somewhere between half an hour and an hour is what it normally. All right, yep. just sign up for that, and you should be able to get it done. Yes. So, are you already a customer of that bank? Are you, Lily? Or is your well, husband? this is it. We've never been involved in their finances, no, no, but no, from no, no, the, but do I, I'm so you would. You, what you do is you get the administration order and or your husband does and goes yes. to the bank with a passport yep. and a driver's license and yep. and ever and a, and a rate notice for you as evidence of living in the community and and they will ultimately register the financial management power okay the other the thing that i wanted to ask some just, of just, the, um, just very quickly i do need to move on here lily Okay, so just one last. Uh, it's in relation to this. So, if the account, if um, if the account is just in his name, we're fine to administer and pay the bills. But if the account is in both names, you'll still get. What happens is that your husband becomes the substitute for your brother-in-law. Okay, so, we're going to leave it with you there, Peter in Clayton. Hi, Peter. How can we help? My elderly mother has a old-fashioned passbook account with the bank but she's physically not able to go into the bank. So I've been her third-party signatory for the last over a decade. So your, your much... signature is in the uh, black light section of the passbook at the back? Uh, presumably. It's on. It's certainly on their system because yes. every time I go into the bank to do a withdrawal, there's no problem. Yes. I just... Um, yeah, I just show my... Uh, you show your ID and, and they then scan the uh, passbook and they give you what you ask for. That Correct. Right? Yes. And this, this, this has worked very well for the last 10 plus years. Yes. Until last week when I walked into a branch and they simply refused. Yes. And I spent an hour and a half in the bank and they started giving me all sorts of interrogations as to what the money was going for, where it was going, evidence of where it was going. And uh, eventually, yeah, I... I, Peter, I, I, I have I, incredible sympathy for the banks. I know it surprises me sometimes. <laughs> uh, but... but <laughs> there have been a whole series of royal com there have been royal commissions and all sorts of inquiries about banks not acting in the best interest of a customer so the bank effectively needs to be and and if they don't act in the best interest of the customer by giving a customer's son access to the customer's money even though there's a written authority in place then they get uh beaten uphill and down dale so um AFCA is who you want to talk to, Australian Financial Complaints Authority, afca.org.au, mm -hmm. and you explain the situation to them and they will take up the matter with the bank. All right. I hope that's helpful, Peter. Um, you should be able to get that through. Lovely comment I want to read out here. David Whiting is with you, dealing with your legal problems at 19 minutes past 10 on ABC Radio Melbourne Mornings. Listen to this uh, from Peter. Listening this morning while caped on, uh, camped on Cape Levesque, North of Broome, 22 degrees with a high of 33. Great to catch up with David Whiting's latest. I love the Listen app. Just remember, you can download that app anywhere, anytime, and listen to any station anytime, although I would always suggest that be ABC Radio Melbourne. Indeed. Cape Levesque is somewhere I've always wanted to camp. Have you been there? No. I, just, I have no, friends I mean, who have I, been there. It sounds I, magnificent. I went to Perth for an afternoon. That's the only time <laughs> as far west Western as, as yeah. he's ever gone. But, but I have clients in Singapore. I've got non-clients. I've got people in Singapore who listen every week. Good morning, Singapore, if yeah. you are listening. Uh, David in Preston, how can we help? Yeah, good morning, uh, Virginia and David. Um, it's a boring old fencing dispute, uh, mm -hmm. unfortunately. Um, uh, the other party involved uh, is refusing to pay their share of the uh, costs after the fence has been built. Do you have an um, agreement with them to pay? Well, we we have a, a verbal agreement. Yes. Um, and uh, I have a an extensive text message 
history um, uh, where we're organising the um, installation of the new fence. Yes. Um, they've sort of uh, come back and said, uh, um, the fence is too high, uh, um, you didn't get uh, council approval, um, you... Uh, sorry, uh, let me ask you, you is the fence too sorry. high, David? Um, the fence is higher than what the uh, council, uh, like the council regulations, state. So you, you, can get a, you can get a permit to fix the problem, but in yep, your I, in your exchanges with your in your voluminous text messages, is there? Yes. Do you tell them what the height of the fence is? Oh yeah, um, we we so originally yes, so had, yes we'll do a, right. Yeah, yeah. So the answer yep. would be, I have an agreement to contribute, and if necessary, you can make an application to council for what amounts to retrospective building permission for the height of the fence. Okie dokie. Um, so in terms of their um, responsibility, they've kind of got no leg to stand on, essentially, if we've got all of that well, evidence. Well, where given, sort of given that you and I have been talking for one minute and 48 seconds, I'm. it sounds right. So, so David, I would be... Um, did you... I would be trying to get the fencer to sue for the cost because the fencer can take it to VCAT. You've got mm. to take it to the magistrate's court. Because oh, a trader consumer dispute goes to the magistrate, goes to VCAT. Yep. And a, a I'm not upset with my neighbour dispute goes to the magistrate's yeah, to court. The magistrate's court. Yep. yep. Okay. Um, okay. Are we able to recoup the costs of doing that from them? If you will the get most of them back, but you won't get all of them back. You actually okay. have to do a cost-benefit analysis of whatever you do, yeah, yeah, but see yeah. if you can get the fencer to do it. Okay, good yep. luck. Hope that helps. Georgia in Glen Iris. Go ahead, Georgia. What's the issue? Good morning. Um, my question is about um, owners' cautions in, in apartment buildings. I recently moved into an SDA uh, in an apartment building. And Sorry, I've had what's complaints. an SDA? What's an SDA? An SDA is a supported living accommodation through okay. the NDIS. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I'm a care user, so I need an accessible apartment. Mm -hmm. And I've had uh, a phone call from the building manager telling me that my laundry is on the balcony. Um, my balcony is a glass balcony, so they can see in, uh, and that the owners' corporation did not allow this. And I rang up. There's no no el no place else that I can dry my my laundry. Uh, it's a ridiculous question to ask, and I do. I, I I'm hoping I'm not taking up your time, but I've rang up no, uh, legal no, aid. Not. Georgia, here's the problem. All right. Uh, if it's an issue for you, it ought to be an issue for the people who supplied you with the unit. Now, I see lots and lots of owners corporation rules, particularly for multi-storey buildings, that say no laundry on the balcony. And if you and if you drive around and you look at some of these buildings that are ten and fifteen storeys high, there's lots of laundry on the bar on the boundary. And I, I probably, you know, if I, they just don't look that pleasant. But what you need to do is, if is you can search and get a copy of the owner's corporation rules. Now, yeah. if it's the model rules, which are the ones that everybody starts with, there's not going to be a restriction on your laundry on the balcony. But if, yeah. they, are, if they are updated rules, or like in a multi-storey building, it is quite possible there will be that restriction. Can they not allow me to do that? There's no place else for me to dry my laundry. No, no, what I, was I, suggested I, I, to me I, was to dry it in my apartment. I, that was I, I the understand. suggestion that yeah. was given to me. Yeah, but I, I'm, I can't address the, the way it happens, but it's in a sense, it's like you've been provided with an apartment that's not suitable for your needs. Yes. So I would be going to the people who supplied you with the apartment and saying to them... I've got this issue with what you gave to me. So look at the model rules first. If you don't get what you, or the rules of the owners' corporation there, if you don't get what you want, then you need to go back to your rental provider and say, I'm sorry, this doesn't work. I need you to find me somewhere else. Okay, Georgia, I, I hope that's useful to you because uh, they haven't provided you with an apartment that's fit for purpose because yes. you need to be able to dry your, your laundry yep. and so perhaps, perhaps they have some other accommodation options for you. Uh, Jack in Reservoir. Go ahead, Jack. G'day. I've got a old old neighbour who moved into a rental 
property that has electrified roller shutters yep. that operate through a battery uh, remote control. Mm-hmm. She was never given working remote control, so she cannot close the roll shutters at night or open them w- while there's, they're up in the up position. Yes. So what I want to know is, has she got a right to get working remotes for the roll shutters because it helps a lot with the heating and cooling off the property you've, during the winter and summer? You've got to look and see what her rental agreement says. I mean, there's if it says rental electric roller shutters, then there's an expectation that they work. Okay. All right. Now, if it doesn't mention electric roller shutters, then it's just something that sits on the window that nobody has anything to do with. So I would be... uh, I'd go and talk to the agent and say, I've got electric roller shutters. My expectation is they work. All right. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. That would seem ridiculous to provide the shutters and not to give them... Well, no, no, that's... uh, they don't work and I don't want to take them away, so I'll just leave them and we won't talk about them. Yes, yeah. It might be the landlord's view. That, that may be it as well. Uh, let me see if we can just do uh, a last one here. Natalie and Carnegie, just quickly, go ahead. Hi there, Virginia and David. Um, look, I'm just one of three siblings acting as an executor on our father's will. Um, it's been 18 months since um, the grant of probate and my two other siblings are being very difficult to deal with in... I, I take it they're the executors and you're not. Is that right, Natalie? No, 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 no. No, we're all three executors. Yes. And um, there's four siblings, so one sibling's on executor. But, um, you know, as I said, the probate was granted 18 months ago and we have sold one property. There's several more properties to be sold, which they're not sort of really coming forward to um, sign up to have it sold or, you know, they're not interested in releasing funds anytime soon. Nat- Natalie, I'm conscious that... Um, what you've got is an estate which is a, is big enough to have a fight over. Yes. What you might consider is making an application for them to be fired as executors. Okay, and so how do I do that? It's an application that you make to the Supreme Court, but there's a fair bit of effort in setting them up. So it's, you know, here's the letter. Uh, I, I suggest we do this in relation to the administration of the estate. Why isn't the property sold? Which ones are we putting on the market? When are, in a sense, give them a strategy which, if they reject, provides the grounds for your claim. All right. Good Great. luck. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And does that often work, David? It does. Yeah. Right. The court is willing to do that? The court is reluctant to do it because yeah. if you choose X as your executor, then logically it should be X. Yeah. But if X is not acting in the best interest of all of the beneficiaries... Mm. Then and and what Natalie says is I've got a property that's sold and they won't distribute the money and I've got other properties to sell. Mm. We're looking at a state worth I would have thought millions of dollars. It then becomes worth pushing the executors to move them on. David, always great to see you. See you Thank next you. week. David Whiting, Melbourne solicitor.